Is it just me or does it feel like the only way you and I can save the world from climate change or global warming is by owning a Tesla or an electric vehicle? As if if we drive gas or diesel, the world is coming to an end. Matter of fact, we just recently saw President Biden talk about the fact that by 2030, 50% of all cars need to be EVs. And even Newsom talked about the fact that by 2035, 100% of the cars need to be EVs. But the story is deeper than that. The more we research, the more bizarre it got with China, with Congo, with cobalt, with lithium, with child labor. Very bizarre, but we're going to get right into it in today's episode. So stick around for the very end to get the PDF of what we're talking about today. But there's a few questions that we have to answer. Number one, the argument for having EVs and the argument against it. Number two, which industry will benefit the most from EVs? Number three, who is hurt by EVs? Number four, are EVs the new diesel scandal waiting to happen? And then some final thoughts on today's discussion. So first things first, there's a lot of good motives here. People are concerned, younger generation, climate change, global warming, but is it really worth it? Here's why, because when we look at the total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector in 2020, this is what it looks like. 29% is caused by transportation, 25% is electricity, 24% is industry, which is raw material we all use, 13% is commercial and residential, 11% is agriculture, but this is the key. Today's focus is transportation, and out of the 29%, only 16.82% of it is cars. So the question becomes, is the 16.82% the cars, everything, let's change everything up, 2030, 2035, is that worth the shift that we're making today? To fully understand that, we have to look at some numbers. Here's some numbers to look at in regards to total cars sold in Q4 of 2021. In Q4 of 2021, we sold a little over 3.3 million cars in the U.S., of which only 152,000 were diesel, 353,000 were EV, and then the rest, which is about 2.761 million, are just regular gasoline cars. And by the way, for some of you, just to show you how new this is, we've only been selling EVs roughly since 2010. Tesla, who is the main leader in this market, has only sold 1.917 million 450 cars and FYI, since 2016 to the first half of 2021, they've sold roughly a third of all EVs in America. Okay, so now that we saw some of those numbers, let's, let's look at the argument between having an EV versus not having one. So price-wise, if you want to buy an EV today, the average EV today is roughly 56437 versus the average gasoline car is $47,077, according to Kelly Blue Book. So if you look at the numbers right there, it's only a $10,000 difference, but if you do buy an EV, you get a $7,500 tax credit on the back end from the government. So maybe it's not up front, but you are getting it on the back end. Now let's take a look at miles. When it comes on to miles, let's compare two cars. I drive an F-150. So let's look at the F-150, that's gas, versus the F-150, that's EV, which is called the Lightning. So if we were to look at the regular F-150, it would cost you $99.31 to fill up the gas tank. That's at an average of $4.32. But if you had the Lightning, it would only cost you $13.48 to charge the battery. So what does that number break down to? Here's what it looks like. On the F-150, the regular one, it comes down to $0.20 cents a mile versus the Lightning, it comes down to $0.06 cents a mile. That's a big savings, nearly a third of the cost for regular gas. Now, a few things. If you own the EV, you have no emissions, no gas, less maintenance. Of course, you're going to have to change your tires and the basic things, but when it comes down to the EV, they can pretty much update on their own. You know, software updates going to happen regularly. You don't need to do an oil change. You don't need to do all the other stuff that you go to a mechanic for. You don't have that with the EV, which saves you a lot of time. So now, so far, you may say, oh my God, Pat, you already sold me. I'm going to go buy an EV tomorrow. I'm buying a Tesla tomorrow. Matter of fact, I'm going online to order a Tesla. Before you do, hang tight, hear the entire argument. The complete opposite side says the following. Number one, if you have a car that's a regular car going off of gas, you can find gas stations pretty much everywhere. Now, if you drive an EV and you're going on a road trip, good luck finding a charging station because that's spotty at best. And on top of it, many of them that you may find, maybe not even working. One of the questions we asked on Twitter, we said, what's your biggest argument against EV? One guy commented and said, I am an EV owner. I drive my car, but half the charging stations are broken and it's frustrating for an owner. Next, when it comes down to Tesla, the makeup of a typical Tesla owner is a six-figure earner who's making money, who can afford to finance 
a $57,000 car with tax and everything included. Even though you're getting the $7,500 on the back end, don't forget, you need to finance the whole thing up front. So you need to make money to be able to buy an EV like a Tesla. So at this point, again, you may say, Pat, you still haven't changed my mind. I'm still getting an EV and I'm sticking to it. No problem. There's two things you need to know about. The current EVs that they're producing, you need lithium and you need cobalt, okay, to produce the EVs that they're producing. Now, what's the big deal about lithium? Let me explain to you. Over a single year, producing 60 tons of lithium at the site could mean digging up as much as 20 to 30 million tons of earth. Yes, earth, like if you look at the picture right there, that's earth, you see that big hole? We need to do that to get 60 tons of lithium. More than the annual amount of earth dug up to produce all coal output of all but seven or eight US states. That's pretty insane to think about. Hauling the material, wait for this one, will require 75 tractor trailers loads a day, every one of them running on, ready? Fossil fuels. And this doesn't include the excavators, the diggers, any of that other stuff. And it doesn't include the transportation of the employees going there. I'm just giving you the basics of lithium here. Now let's take a look at cobalt. When it comes down to cobalt reserves, we have roughly 7.6 million worldwide, of which you have countries like US have 69,000, China 80,000, Madagascar 100,000, Canada 220, Russia 250, Philippines 260, Cuba 500,000, Indonesia 600,000, Australia 1.4 million. You ready? Democratic Republic of Congo, 3.5 million tons of reserves of cobalt, which by the way, 15 out of the 19 mines in Congo are owned and operated by China. Let me say that one more time. 15 out of 19 are owned and operated by China, which by the way, they bought this land in Africa nearly two decades ago, which is a massive bet that they took thinking one day this, you know, people say, oh, this is such a visionary. This guy's such a visionary. Two decades ago is 2002. 2002 ain't nobody driving Teslas. But in 2002, they kind of said, we may be going in this direction that cobalt. Nobody looks at cobalt and looks at it as anything. You've seen ceramics of cobalt, but you don't wake up one morning and saying, we need to go buy cobalt, right? That's what they did. 15 out of 19, which if you were to look at the DNA of China and you were to say, what would their motive be? Maybe they're thinking about not selling the cobalt to others. Maybe they're thinking about producing the cars that need cobalt because the world has to buy the cars from them, it's a form of a monopoly, isn't it? If we go in that direction, gotta give them credit for making a decision like that. But at the end of the day, that in itself could lead to something where other countries are relying on China to get cobalt from them, just like the world has been relying on China to get chips and many other products that we felt during COVID. According to human rights organization Amnesty International, the growth has put pressure on miners in the DRC to ramp up production leading in turn to tens of thousands of children being lured or forced into grueling and dangerous mine work. You know, sometimes when we're trying to solve a problem, you, you're like, well, yeah, we have to do this because we got to get away from fossil fuel. And then when you really look it up and you put the map together, like, wait a minute, to get to where we want to get to, we have to make some, some kind of sacrifices. So no, let's not do fossil fuel because God forbid global warming and, you know, everything, climate change that we're going through. But yeah, let's do lithium and take 20 to 30 million tons and dig up from the earth well, that's pretty bad if we keep doing that. Uh, and, yeah, how about we go get cobalt and we get through China 15 to 19 mines they own and 50% plus of it isn't there. So we have to go through Congo and they got a monopoly. I mean, we got to get away from cobalt. Or, 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 but we still got to do it. But how about the child labor? Oh my God, so what do we, so should we go this direction or not? It's a very conflicted, bizarre decision processing that we're going through. So there's not really a, we're making the right decision, we're not making the right decision. It's very complex, but let me continue. So the next question is which industries will benefit from EVs? So the first one is battery manufacturers. Obviously this is gonna be very big for them because if this is a direction that we're going to, companies that develop batteries for EVs are set to see huge upturn in adoption of these vehicles worldwide. Matter of fact, if the sale of EVs continue at the anticipated rate, a study suggests a total of $60 billion worth of batteries will need to be produced to cater to this demand. So that's one industry is going to take a massive, massive profit from this uh, direction that we go to. Number two is EV manufacturers, which is pretty obvious. You got 
Tesla and anybody else that's producing EVs, they're going to see a This is why Tesla's valued at nearly a trillion dollars and have only sold 1.9 million cars. That's pretty insane to see numbers like that. And then you have transport, you know, whether it's transport, public transportation, they're going to have to convert to that because it's less maintenance, less headache. Of course, the cost of getting it up front is going to be more, but it's going to be less headache and, you know, uh, maintenance on the back end. And last but not least is utility providers as more drivers opt to install an EV charging point at home, their energy usage will inevitably increase. In fact, predictions suggest that the average household energy consumption will double with the installation of an EV charging point. So the next question is who will be hurt by EVs? Many will say big oil. However, even if electric vehicles come to entirely dominate the transportation space, ExxonMobil is expecting little change in global oil use. The oil major predicts that oil use for transportation will decline slowly, but overall, oil demand will continue to rise as crude is needed for industry and petrochemicals. Here's what a spokesperson from ExxonMobil said. If every car sold in 2025 was an EV, leading to every single passenger vehicle in the world being an EV by 2040, the global demand for oil and gas would be the same as it was in 2010. They won't even feel it. But who will feel it? is going to be that small little business owner that owns that gas station in the corner. You know who I'm talking about. You go to Mobile, Exxon, whoever it is, not Exxon, but some of those guys that own that franchise, they will feel it because that's eventually going to go away. So uh, for those of you that drive diesel, you may want to skip this next part because the decision you made to get diesel, this may offend you. So brace for impact. Are electric vehicles the new diesel scandal waiting to happen? So Bjorn Lomberg, the author of False Alarm, wrote an article for Daily Mail which was titled, are electric cars the new diesel scandal waiting to happen? He says, do you remember Britain's dash for diesel? It began more than 20 years ago when then Chancellor Gordon Brown announced a new car tax system favoring vehicles with lower emissions of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming. Diesel cars tend to be more fuel efficient with lower emissions and Mr. Brown held them as greener and cheaper option. Over a decade and a half, the number of such vehicles on British roads quadrupled. What happened? What didn't emerge until much later, although it was no secret in the motor industry or among government officials, was that diesel cars also emitted greater quantities of other pollutants, nitrogen oxide, and particulates that damage air quality and human health. Such particulates, which have been linked to respiratory problems, heart disease, and lung cancer, have been responsible for thousands of premature deaths. Britain wasn't alone, of course. In their desire to be seen as ever greener governments of richer countries were all pursuing the same policies on car tax or cutting duty on diesel fuel. So what's the moral of the story? None of us know if this thing's gonna work or not. Nobody knows. Diesel, they took a big bet in Britain 20 years later, they realized maybe it wasn't the right bet that we took. It didn't work, it backfired. If US, their cars is only 4.6% diesel, 50% of cars in Europe is diesel. Let me say that one more time. 10 times more than US cars. In Europe, one out of every two cars is diesel. They all bet on this diesel thing. They don't work for them. Watch what someone said about the direction we're going with EVs. The International Energy Agency, IEA, estimates that if every nation achieves its ambitious targets on increasing electric car, electric car ownership, it will reduce CO2 emissions in this decade by 235 million tons, which means what? According to the UN Climate Panel Standard Model, we'll reduce the global temperature by one ten thousandth of a degree Celsius. That's 0. 0.0001 Celsius by the end of the century. So is it really worth it? So I'm curious, if you want to see more content like this, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you do want to get today's content in a PDF, click over here to get the PDF. And if you want to see another video similar to this, I did a video titled Climate Change, Myth or Reality. If you haven't watched it, click over here to watch that video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.